One of the subfields of international law is international economic law. In this knowledge clip, we are going to look at what is international economic law, and in particular, we are going to focus on international trade law. In order to do so, I'm going to first uh, take you to the main, through the main historical steps of the development of international economic law, and then in the second part of this presentation, I'm going to focus on international trade law and its core principles. So, which are the uh, main historical steps? Um, before World War II, actually, international economic um, relations were mainly dealt with at the bilateral level. So states uh, concluded a series of uh, treaties, uh, so-called treaties of uh, friendly commerce and navigations, where they would uh, recognize to each other eventually uh, some uh, preferential treatments. Um, there was as well, uh, there were already some quite uh, well-known and recognized and applied uh, principles in relation to the protection of islands and their property. But it's really only after World War II that uh, international economic matters become one of the priority of, international, of the international community. So even before the end of World War II, in 1944, we have the first multilateral negotiations in Bretton Woods, um, we, uh, at the end of which we had the creation of the International Monetary Fund and of the World Bank, which at that time was not the World Bank, but was called the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development. Had the main goal of that bank was actually to help uh, states which had mainly suffered for World War II to reconstruct their infrastructure. So uh, at that time uh, what emerged was that international, the international management of economic matters become a, a, core, uh, a core issue in order to guarantee international peace and security and that the best way to deal with it is actually multilateralism and not bilateralism. But of course uh, there has been some problems afterwards in relation to some very important historical events which directly influenced the way in which that cooperation and multilateralism uh, was shaped. So one defining moment uh, was for sure the colonization and the emergence of the so-called new international economic order. Um, on the basis of this new international economic order, in particular, in new, newly independent states were uh, a bit contesting the um, international uh, economic uh, agreements which were reached after the Second World War and uh, which did not take into consideration their very peculiar situations. Um, so on the, one of their claims was actually the recognition of the permanent sovereignty of natural resources uh, which was then integrated in the resolution of the UN General Assembly and which is now uh, considered as a, a customary rule. Um, in that uh, historical phase as well, uh, new independent states actually uh, started a series of expropriations um, of uh, some of the investments made by foreign investors on the basis of contracts that they concluded with the former colonial power and the new independent states did not rec recognize the conditions of those contracts and thus expropriated uh, the goods. Of course, the nationality states of the foreign investors were not so happy and pushed for some sort of international protection of those interests. One as well of the outcome of that historical period is actually the international regime of the deep seabed area. Uh, you can find more detail about it in the second knowledge clip on the law of the sea. Another defining moment is actually the end of the Cold War. Uh, and uh, with the end of the Cold War and the, um, actually the, the, the failure of uh, uh, the communist uh, bloc, uh, the free trade uh, becomes uh, the priority and the existing international institution embraced uh, the neoliberalism approach, uh, which was of course supported by the US and the Western bloc. And it's in that historical phase that actually uh, the international community managed to reach an agreement on the institution, on the creation of the WTO, the World Trade Organization in 1995. 
In the last uh, 15 years, we have as well a series of uh, quite important developments whose impact is a bit difficult to assess at the moment, but that we need to maybe uh, just flag out uh, at this stage. Uh, one of them is actually a, a return to bilateralism, as uh, many states um, uh, actually are not pleased well, on how uh, the WTO has been evolving, on how the WTO is managing certain issues, and so we really have a trend back towards uh, more uh, bilateral agreements than multilateral ones. Um, so we have more and more free trade agreements which have been adopted uh, in the last years since, for instance, on the ongoing negotiation between the US and the EU for the TTIP. Um, and then one uh, very important trend of the last, I would say, 20 years is actually the um, incorporation within international economic law or of concerns which actually derive from other fields of international law, uh, such as human rights and the protection of uh, the environment. Let's see now what we have uh, in terms really of regulation uh, in the field of international trade law. So international trade law uh, really uh, was born in 1947 with the adoption of the GATT, uh, the General Agreement of Tariff and Trade. Uh, this was actually a multilateral framework created in order to facilitate the adoption of bilateral agreements for uh, the recognition of uh, trade uh, concessions, advantages between the members of the GATT system. Uh, one of the core uh, principles of this system was the most favored nation clause, which uh, consisted of the fact that when a state was actually um, granting a, most, uh, a more favorable treatment to another state, so state A gave a more uh, favorable treatment to state B, then state C and D, which are already in a relationship with state A, could also invoke the same favorable treatment. Uh, but the GATT was a, a weak uh, system because it didn't have a strong institutional framework which was in charge of actually uh, guaranteeing and supervising the implementation of the agreements. And this changed uh, with uh, uh, the adoption of the Marrakesh Agreement in 1995 and the creation of the World Trade Organization. Uh, in this case, we have then a strong um, institutional framework uh, which is uh, in charge of uh, supervising, monitoring and implementing the relevant agreements which includes the GATT but as well as agreements which have been adopted after the GATT such as the GATT which is uh, the, um, uh, the agreement on the trade on services or the TRIPS which is uh, the agreement on the trade on uh, intellectual property products and one of the novelties of this uh, institutional framework is actually the creation of a dispute settlement understanding uh, where we have a system of panels and appellate bodies uh, appellate body, sorry, and, uh, with, um, and the outcome of the procedures uh, actually um, in front of the dispute settlement body of the WTO uh, is binding for the states, so it uh, has a judgment or an arbitral award. The core principles of the uh, WTO system are, first of all, the tarification, so the prohibition uh, to use quantitative restriction on imports and exports of goods. Then the non-discrimination, so a state cannot adopt measures which have as a result to discriminate the national of certain states in relation uh, comparatively to the nationals of another state, of course, in relation to trade. Um, another core principle is the national treatment. So states have to grant to uh, foreigners the same type of treatment that they grant to their own nationals. And then the most favored national treatment that we uh, have from uh, the GATT. Uh, there are, however, general exceptions to the core principles uh, which can uh, ju be justified on the basis of morals or for the protection of human rights or for the protection of the marine environment uh, of, or of the environment, sorry, and you find this exception in Article 20 of the GATT and this Article 20 actually guarantees um, a regulatory space uh, for the territorial state, but however, those exceptions are uh, quite restrictively interpreted. Uh